Zenobia was the queen of the Palmyrene Empire who challenged the authority of Rome during the latter part of the period of Roman history known as the Crisis of the 3rd century 235-284, defined by constant civil war allowing for breakaway regions to form governments. The crisis has been noted by historians for widespread social unrest, economic instability, and, most significantly, the dissolution of the empire, which broke into three separate regions, the Gallic Empire, the Roman Empire, and the Palmyrene Empire. The chaos of the central government was such that any attempts to control the outer regions were considered secondary, and so, for a time, the empire split into three distinct political entities, including Zenobius. Contrary to popular assertions, Zenobia never led a revolt against Rome, may never have been paraded through Rome's streets in chains, and was almost certainly not executed by the Emperor Aurelian 270-275. While all of these sources maintain that Queen Zenobia of Palmyra challenged the authority of Rome, none of them characterize her actions as an outright rebellion. While she was careful not to engage Rome directly in military conflict, it is clear she increasingly disregarded Roman authority in establishing herself as the legitimate monarch of the East. Zenobia was born in Palmyra, Syria sometime around 240 and given the name Julia Aurelia Zenobia. Syria was at this time a Roman province, and had been since it was annexed in 115. Zenobia was a Roman citizen, as her father's family had been granted that status earlier, probably during the reign of Marcus Aurelius 161 to 180. Zenobia was educated in Greek and Latin, though may have had difficulty with them, but was fluent in Egyptian and Aramaic, and claimed ancestry from the legendary Dido of Carthage and Cleopatra VII of Egypt. According to the Arabic version of her story told by Al-Tabari, she was placed in charge of the family flocks and shepherds when she was a young girl and thereby grew used to ruling over men. Altabari also claims that this is when she became adept at riding horses and learned the endurance and stamina she was later known for. It is recorded she would march on foot with her troops long distances, could hunt as well as any man, and could outdrink anyone. By 258, Zenobia was married to Lucius Septimus Odentus, Roman governor of Syria, with whom she had at least one son, the Balathus. She was Odenthus' second wife, and he had a son and heir, Herods, from his first marriage. Odenthus ruled over a very prosperous region and especially the city of Palmyra, which was an important trade center on the Silk Road between the east and the west. Merchants coming to or returning from Rome had to stop in Palmyra to pay taxes and simply to rest. Since around the year 227, however, Trade had been halted at intervals by the Sassanid Persians who periodically blocked the route to exact tribute. Silk had been among the most popular commodities in Rome from before the time of Augustus 27 BC 14 C, and the Romans were not pleased with these disruptions in trade. The Sassanid king Shiparai 240-272 took the city of Antioch, one of the most important trade centers for Rome, and this could not be tolerated. In 260 the Roman Emperor Valerian marched against the Sassanids, was defeated by them, and taken prisoner. Allegedly he was then used as a footstool by Shiparai to mount his horse until he died in captivity, and was then stuffed and put on display. His son, Gallienius, could do nothing to remedy the situation, and so Odenthus marched against the Sassanids, defeated them, and drove them back across the Euphrates River and away from Syria. Although Odenthus presented himself as acting in Rome's interest to try to save Valerian, he actually had other motives. He had tried to form an alliance with Shapurai, was rebuffed, and only then became his enemy. For his service to Rome, Odenthus was made governor of the entire eastern part of the Roman Empire. In 261, when the usurper Quietus challenged Gallienius' rule, Odenthus defeated and killed him and after this, had enough power and prestige to effectively rule over his realm almost independent of Rome. In 266 he was assassinated along with his son Herod's, by his nephew after a dispute following a hunting trip. While some sources have claimed, or at least suggested, that Zenobia had him murdered so that her son could become king, this has been rejected by most later writers and historians. Zenobia then became regent, since Vibalathus was still a minor. She surrounded herself at court with intellectuals and philosophers, among them the Platonist Cassius Longinus 213-273 who would later be blamed for encouraging her break with Rome. Thus far, the relationship between Palmyra and Rome had been amicable because Odenthus' military actions had been just as much in Rome's favor as in his own. When Zenobia came to power, she maintained her late husband's policies. 
In the chaos of Rome which characterized the crisis of the 3rd century, 26 men had come and gone as emperor. Odenthus may have thought that he could be next by proving himself of value to Gallienus and by amassing his own wealth by plundering the cities of the Sassanids. After his death, Zenobia may have considered that her son, or even she herself, could rule Rome and so continued her husband's reign as he had conducted it. Gallienus was assassinated in 268 and replaced by Claudius II who then died from fever and was succeeded by Quintilus in 270. Throughout this time, Zenobia's policies steadily changed and, in 269, seeing that Rome was too busy with its own problems to notice her, she sent her general Zabdas at the head of her army into Roman Egypt and claimed it as her own. Even in this, however, she was careful not to appear to be in conflict with Rome. A Syrian Egyptian by the name of Timogenes had started a revolt against Roman rule while the Roman governor was away on campaign, and Zenobia's march on Egypt could have been explained as a campaign in the interests of Rome. It seems, however, that Timogenes may have been an instigator sent earlier by Zenobia to provide an excuse for the invasion. The Syrians were at first successful but then were driven out of Egypt by the returning Roman forces. Not content to simply drive the invaders from Egypt, the Romans pursued the Syrians past the borders and north toward Syria, where the Syrians then mounted a counter-attack and decimated the Roman army. Once she had Egypt, she then entered into diplomatic negotiations with the regions of the Levant and Asia Minor and added them to her growing empire. With Rome in turmoil, the rising, wealthy Palmyrene Empire would have been an attractive choice for the provincial rulers in these regions, and Rome remained too occupied with internal strife to do anything about Zenobia's expanding empire. Although it is clear that she was creating her own empire in opposition to Rome, she still did nothing to warrant open conflict with the empire. By this time Aurelian was emperor, and Zenobia had coins minted displaying an image of Abalathus on one side and Aurelian on the other as joint rulers of Egypt. She had inscriptions to Aurelian's honor placed in Palmyra and included his name on official correspondence. At the same time, however, she adopted the imperial titles of Augustus for Vibalathus and Augusta for herself, titles which were the privilege of the royal family of Rome alone. She also conducted trade agreements, negotiated with the Sassanid Persians, and added territories to her empire without consulting Rome or even considering Rome's interests. By 271 she ruled over an empire which stretched from modern-day Iraq across through Turkey and down through Egypt. While the other emperors had failed to notice what Zenobia was doing, or simply did not have the resources to do anything about it, Aurelian was a very different kind of ruler. He had risen in the ranks from infantryman to general and, now, to emperor, and he was a soldier first and politician second. When he assumed rule he had to contend with defeating the Vandals, Alamanni, and the Goths but, by 272, he was ready to reclaim the eastern provinces from Zenobia. He did not send envoys with letters asking for an explanation nor did he wait for Zenobia to offer one on her own. He marched on the Palmyrene Empire with his entire army. Entering Asia Minor, he destroyed every town and city loyal to Zenobia and fought off various robber attacks while on the march, until he reached Tyana, home of the famous philosopher Apollonius of Tyana whom Aurelian admired. In a dream, Apollonius came to Aurelian and counseled him to be merciful if he wished to obtain victory, and so Aurelian spared the city and marched on. Mercy proved to be very sound policy because the other cities recognized that they would do better to surrender to an emperor who was merciful than incur his wrath by resisting. After Tyana, none of the cities opposed him and sent word of their allegiance to Aurelian before he ever reached their gates and so, soon, he arrived in Syria. Whether Zenobia had tried to make contact with Aurelian before this is not known. There are reports of letters between them once he reached Palmyra, but they are thought to be later inventions. His letter to her at the start of his campaign demanding her surrender and her arrogant response, given in the Historia Augusta, are also thought to be fabrications created to highlight Aurelian's merciful and reasonable approach to the conflict as contrasted with Zenobia's haughty response. While Aurelian had been on the march, Zenobia had rallied her troops and the two armies met outside the city of Daphne at the Battle of Imi in 272 BC. Aurelian won the engagement by feigning retreat and then swinging about in a pincer formation once the Palmyrene forces were tired from pursuit. The Palmyrians were routed and then slaughtered. Zenobia herself, along with her general Zabdas, fled to the city of Emesa where she had more men and, also, stored her treasury. Aurelian pursued her while she regrouped and reorganized her forces, and the armies met again in battle outside of Emesa where the Romans were again victorious using precisely the same tactic they had used at Imi. 
They pretended to retreat in the face of the Palmyrian cavalry, which pursued, and then turned and attacked them from an auspicious position. The Palmyrian forces were destroyed and Aurelian took the city and, it is assumed, plundered the treasury. Zenobia, however, had again escaped. She went to Palmyra where she prepared the city for defense, and Aurelian followed close behind, besieging the city. The historian Edward Gibbon writes, She retired within the walls of her capital, made every preparation for a vigorous resistance, and declared, with the intrepidity of a heroine, that the last moment of her reign and of her life should be the same. Whether she declared anything like that is not known, but it seems clear that she was hoping for reinforcements and aid to come from the Persians and, when it failed to arrive, she fled Palmyra with her son on the back of a camel and tried to reach safety in Persia. When Aurelian entered Palmyra and found her gone, he sent cavalry to apprehend her, and she was taken prisoner while trying to cross the Euphrates River. She was brought back to Aurelian in chains where she protested her innocence and blamed her actions on the bad advice given her by her advisors, chiefly Cassius Longinus, who was promptly executed. Zenobia was then brought back to Rome. 